Hey guys, so this video is really a condensed version of Charles Hoskinson's whiteboard about decentralization. I went through and I sorted through it. I kind of cut out a lot of the ums and ahs or the pauses and anything that wasn't really specifically relevant to proof of work versus proof of stake. So you can watch it here. I highly suggest you do the first 13 minutes are really what hits home the whole point. And then there's a little bit at the end, just kind of explaining it, but definitely worth the watch, which is why I condensed it down and I wanted to share it with you guys. So enjoy. Bitcoin has this model called proof of work. Proof of work is a meritocratic lottery. So basically you have a miner and a miner is sitting there all day long and it's computing uh, basically magic numbers, looking for uh, a certain number, like a ticket to basically win. Every second it's able to compute a set of potential tickets to win. And eventually a miner gets lucky and one of those turns out to be a winning set. And then this gives the miner the right to advance Bitcoin. Uh, this happens hopefully every approximately 10 minutes and the difficulty increases increases over time as more people participate. More people have an incentive to participate as the price of Bitcoin goes up. Difficulty goes up as price goes up. How hard it is to find these magic numbers is directly connected to price because as price goes up, more competition occurs, more competition occurs, more difficult to ensure that we make Bitcoins basically every 10 minutes. Now here's the problem. As difficulty goes up, proof of work gets more centralized and this is unavoidable. Why does it get more centralized? Well, you have to go from CPUs to increasingly more specialized hardware. Anybody can buy a CPU. Your price of admission is very low there. That's Intel, AMD, ARM, etc. Anybody can buy a GPU. Okay, that's NVIDIA, AMD, and they're in pretty good circulation. But then when you start getting to increasingly more specialized things like FPGAs or ASICs, these are custom and in many cases they're patented and in many cases they're owned by private companies. And guess what? They don't have to sell these to you. If it's patented, you can't make it. If it's a private company, the private company doesn't have to sell it to you. And given that it's custom, what does it mean? The supply chain of these things is very, very tight. Okay. So if these are the only devices that you can use to mine, then you tell me, is the fact that somebody gets the right to decide who gets it open or closed? Your ability to profit to make money on Bitcoin mining is directly connected to not only your access to ASICs, but it's also connected to your price of electricity, price of power. What if you live in a country with very expensive electricity? What if you live in a country where you have political connections, you get free power or inexpensive power? Based on geography and political connections, your price of power may vary. How is that fair for people who don't live in countries with subsidized power or they live in countries with very expensive power? Two factors that limit access to mining, geographically and also one in the supply chain. So the other thing is because there can only be one winner and if there are multiple winners, there's a competition between them and one of the blocks ends up being an orphan block. You then have a situation where it tends towards economy of scale. So what does that mean, economy of scale? It means that the larger actors tend to do better. They can optimize things, they can build better data centers, they can have better network access. And so your ticket of admission is now greater than $100 million worth of hardware. So the people who are making real money, who have real power, those are people who have invested greater than $100 million into their mining operations. Huge ticket price to entry because of economy of scale. These people do very good and people who aren't them really don't make a lot for the ASIC mining side of things on Bitcoin. Not to say you can't make some money and participate, but if you want to run a business, a professional opportunity, there's a huge bias towards the rich. So Bitcoin, you need ASICs, you need subsidized power. You also benefit substantially for economy of scale. And there's a huge bias towards the rich and you need a big chunk of money to be able to participate. Which is why, if you look at every single year, 2009, 2010, all the way to 2020, you know what's happened? There's an increasingly smaller supply of major mining operations to a point where approximately 10 ops run the show. 10 big actors control more than 51% of the resource. You have guys like Jimmy and uh, Tone, they run around and tell you Bitcoin is the best thing in the whole wide world. Mining is the only way to truth. By the way, can you participate? Well, Bitcoin's so decentralized. It's so decentralized. And you say, well, the people who maintain the system, 
They live outside of the system. They are consuming a custom resource that's patented in private. It benefits tremendously from the price of electricity, and they got to have a lot of money to be able to play and participate. That doesn't sound to me like a decentralized system, and lo and behold, over time, you get increasingly more federated. That's the reality we live in right now. Now, let's look at proof of stake. Proof of stake needs a resource too. Our resource isn't an ASIC. Our resource is the underlying token, ADA. All right, let's look at this. Do you need subsidized electricity for proof of stake? No. You don't. Regardless of the price of electricity, you can still stake. Do you need access to proprietary, private, patented hardware to be able to participate? No, you just need to be able to purchase ADA, which seems to me to be kind of like the CPUs or the GPUs, right? It lives on every exchange. Anybody can purchase that. Okay. Does this benefit from economy of scale? Not really. The way that we designed the protocol after a certain hump, profit's pretty much the same. It scales linearly in that respect. Okay, so you don't need $100 million worth of ADA to be able to participate in the system. Do you need to live in a certain geography to be able to have an advantage over others? No, it's egalitarian in that particular respect. Okay, so no geographic restrictions, no patents, open access to resource, and the poor can participate. And they say, but Charles, does the network get more centralized or less centralized over time? Well, let's look at that. So as the price of ADA goes up, so as we increase the price, you know what happens? That K factor for the amount of stake pools goes up too. K increases. Why? Because it's easy to increase K uh, to, to make more profit for people when you have a higher value token. And we can model that. We published a bunch of blog posts that can show this relationship. So over time, as ADA grows in adoption, Option because it's a finite resource, it becomes more scarce as you get more users and utility inside the system. The price goes up. If the price goes up, the K factor, which is our optimal amount of stake pools in the system, increases. What does that mean? It means that the system has more participants at the staking level actually making blocks. This is the inverse relationship of Bitcoin. When we go to Bitcoin, we say, as the price goes up, the difficulty goes up, the difficulty goes up. You have more economy of scale towards the rich and those who have subsidized power and those who have first access to the ASICs win. So you end up having fewer and fewer and fewer people participating on the consensus level, less and less people like you, everyday people, and more and more millionaires and billionaires with vertically integrated, sophisticated operations and powerful data centers and so forth. This is not the case for the system we've constructed here. You have an open resource that's always going to be available. There's always going to be sellers floating around who are exiting and entering because markets exist, does not yield geographic restrictions. There's no patents. There's no restrictions in that supply chain. You have open access to the resource as a consequence of liquid markets. The poor can participate just as much as the rich can. And as the price goes up, the K factor gets larger. The system gets more participation. And it has the same level of security in terms of Byzantine resistance that Bitcoin does. Uh, and so as long as you assume that no more than 50% plus one of the uh, holdings of ADA are in the hands of honest actors, which, by the way, have a financial incentive for the system to behave correctly, uh, the system is secure. Miners do not have a financial incentive. An attack that Bitcoin can suffer from is let's assume that there are two chains, proof of work one and proof of work two, because they have a shared security security resource, if these two chains achieve the same price, or relatively the same price, then assuming markets exist, if you have enough of that security resource, you actually have an incentive to destroy one of the chains. Why? Because you can make just as much money mining chain two as you can make mining chain one. So since you have this shared resource, if you destroy chain one and short sell it, okay, you basically get downside. You'll make a windfall profit from the destruction of that chain. Then you turn all your resources over to chain two and there's no interruption in your mining profit. So you make windfall from destroying one system and then you're mining another system. Why? It's an external resource. It's not connected to the token price at all. So there's no vested interest in the resource to protecting the very thing that they're protecting. You're paying them to do that. It's mercenary behavior in that respect. Whereas in a proof of stake system, your ADA only works with Cardano. Your EOS tokens only work with EOS. Your Tezos tokens only work with Tezos. Your F2 tokens will only work with Ethereum 2. And if there's a massive decline in price, there's no way to get out of that. You are stuck 
stuck in that system. You'd like that system to be secure and resilient. Your financial interest is directly connected to the price of the token and the security and stability of the system. This is not the case with mining. You can do a gold finger attack at any time. Throughout the years, there's also been things identified like selfish mining. Look that one up and a litany of other game theoretic attacks that exist in the mining world. Not a perfect consensus algorithm. There are ways to improve it and make it better and mitigate these things, but it is absolutely disingenuous to say Bitcoin style mining, which is ASIC heavy, is the end all be all and the only way to provide security. With Genesis, we got bootstrap from Genesis and we have another paper coming out to give us the ability to recover from spikes of dishonest majority. We've already achieved the same synchronization model and we have the same security threshold as Bitcoin. We detailed all of this in beautiful papers that we wrote. Now, is proof of stake perfect? No, there are still many little things here and there and systematically we're working our way through to resolve those edge cases as is Algorand and as all the other science coins doing that. Is proof of work perfect? Absolutely not. It has very real and meaningful problems as stated above. And guess what? These problems are not resolvable with science. You can't change the fact that proof of work tends towards these ASICs for the way that Bitcoin has implemented it. Bitcoin's not going to change. They've accepted that ASICs are fine and over time access to them will not become commoditized. It'll become increasingly more specialized to a point where these companies don't even bother to sell them. You can't change the cost of power and that some company, countries have cheaper electricity than others. And also you can't change the fact that as the price goes up, difficulty goes up and it creates a larger and larger economy of scale which makes a smaller and smaller set of participants in the system. And the proof of stake system, if the price goes up, more people divest, the markets get stronger at any given time, that resource will always be available in some capacity. So you get more and more equal access and we modeled how we can increase the K factor with price. So as the token gets more valuable, there's more profit for the stake pool operators. So you can increase K factor to get more diversity in the stake pool operators, which means you get more and more and more and more stake pools. So you go from 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 and so forth. So if the system is worth the same as Bitcoin, it'll be thousands of times more decentralized in that respect. And decentralized means real human beings, small businesses are running a node and making blocks. By the way, because of this two layer model where you have the regular everyday user and then you have the stake pool operator, what does that mean? It means that you have a trusted layer in the system to deploy layer two solutions. They always ask, where are we gonna get the lightning channels from? Where are we gonna get oracles from? Where are we gonna get cross-chain interoperability from? <gasps> well, we have a special class of small business act operators who are in our system we trust to make blocks for us. That's in getting increasingly more diverse and has an incentive to watch each other and compete with each other. Well, that means that over time, those SPOs will add more services to the system. Okay, and what does that mean? It means there's more use and utility for the system and more profit for the SPOs. So we have an incentive to increase the use and utility by increasing the diversity of stake pool operators because they're trusted actors, because they've pledged amounts and they have brand and reputation inside the system. And if they're caught doing bad things, they lose the stake that's delegated to them and they kind of get kicked out of the system in that respect. You basically can use them as a stable set of actors to do things, whether it be generating random numbers or providing timestamps or Oracle services, et cetera, et cetera. And the system can be run anywhere. Let's say China bans Bitcoin tomorrow. They keep doing that. These all those miners in China. What the hell do they do? You have a hundred million dollar facility. Maybe the government takes it over. Maybe they just throw them all into a warehouse and then the hash power goes down dramatically. Well, with a system like this, if your country passes laws that says running a stake pool is illegal, what you do is you just incorporate abroad in a different country. And then you just run the stake pools under that legal structure. So let's say Germany has bad laws. Maybe you go to Switzerland or Liechtenstein or somewhere else. And because it's a virtual resource, at a click of the button, it can be moved from one country to another country at a click of a button. You cannot do that with a physical resource. And oh, by the way, that physical resource has bizarre game theoretic things where you can do selfish mining goldfinger attacks as well. So it's just laughable. It's absolutely laughable when I see these, these insane videos come out from these maximalists where they just pretend this is the end all be all. Our system is 1.6 million times more energy efficient than Bitcoin at the moment. 1.6 million times. And if their continuing success means that we only get more optimized, by the way, we have an incentive to reduce the energy consumption because that energy consumption has nothing to do with 
your performance as a stake pool operator. So the cheaper hardware that you can use, the more energy efficient hardware you can use to do the same job, the better for you in your bottom line. So your incentive for energy consumption per user is getting lower over time. In Bitcoin, anytime you have an energy gain, you buy more miners. So you can generate more magic numbers to find that winning lottery ticket to advance the network. So it has the opposite effect. Any energy gain means more purchase of hardware, more miners are brought into this way, not a reduction of power. That's just the economics of the system as it is. They can't seem to understand the papers. They don't even wanna read them or discuss them or talk about what areas could improve or what assumptions we've made are unrealistic or how our security model is wrong. The people who do care are professional cryptographers from across the world. And we know they kind of like what we do because they cite our papers and they use them as foundations for their own papers. So that's decentralization of control. Notice they never even talked about decentralization of the network layer of the system. And Bitcoin is a very primitive network stack. And as a consequence, there's all kinds of shenanigans and chicanery that can be done there. Notice they never talk about decentralization of development or decision-making inside the system. So what if the people who make decisions of what goes into the core protocol aren't willing to entertain certain ideas. Then they censor you. And how do you as a holder of that token have a voice and be able to vote on it? We have an on-chain governance system. That same virtual resource that gives you a voice and how the system is going to make blocks and advance itself also gives you a voice on how the system is going to evolve. You have none of that with Bitcoin, but apparently they're more decentralized. So as I often say, think for yourself. And incentives matter. They really do. If your system has the wrong economic incentives, you don't get more decentralized over time. You get less decentralized. If you have the wrong incentives, you start handing power to a certain group of people and you can't get it back. If you have the right incentives, the system will self-evolve into the state that you want. We built Cardano with the goal of it being the world financial operating system. We built it to be as inclusive as possible and give economic identity to billions of people which means that billions of people have to have a voice in it and billions of people have to be able to control and influence it in some way. Not 25 people, 10 businesses, or uh, a handful of hardware manufacturers who basically get to decide who gets what where. And finally, trust the scientific method. This is the single most important part of all of it. The scientific method does not care if you're a woman or a man doesn't care what country you're born in, the color of your skin. It doesn't care if you're rich or poor. It's a process. We didn't start out and say proof of stake was great. The very first paper that was written was a formalization of what was learned from Bitcoin and what it brought to space. Because then that was the basis, the standard to achieve if we wanted to build a competing protocol with better properties. We didn't just say that we had invented a protocol that had these properties. We wrote papers. Those papers were submitted to conferences. The scientific community took a look at them criticized them, critiqued them, suggested changes. And over a period of five years, five years of back and forth and argumentation and thought process, we gradually converged to a system that we thought was better. And you know what? The scientific method is the most beautiful world method in the world for criticism because everyone is paid to be a skeptic, but a structured skeptic. Not skeptical in a sense of, well, I just don't think it works. Skeptical in that... You have every right to criticize anything you want with a counter argument. You can't just say, I don't know. You say, well, here's why I think it doesn't work. Here's a counter example. Here's a flaw in your thinking or a question about your proof. It's a process. And the more you run that process, the stronger the ideas get, the more accepted the ideas get, and eventually you can build them on granite. Incentives absolutely do matter and really think carefully about the incentives that Bitcoin currently has and trust the scientific method. This was a bootstrap protocol. It started everything. It established the PKI. It established the industry. It was a distribution mechanism for tokens. You have to prime the pump. You have to start somewhere. It was a brilliant bootstrap mechanism. But assuming this exists and you have the cryptocurrency economy, you can then move on to more elegant, refined, energy efficient, sustainable protocols. They're stuck in the past because they own the past and they don't really want people to come in and compete with them that things that are 1.6 million times more energy efficient will always get cheaper to operate and always get more decentralized. And also this layer two thing scares the hell out of them because that's truly decentralized and their business model, if Bitcoin is working, is to be for-profit private companies that live in the orange.
That's their business model. They don't like the stake pool operators. Why? Because they're being replaced by them and they're being replaced at a much lower scale. You don't need $100 million of funding from Silicon Valley to start your own block stream. You can be a single mom in Georgia. You can be a stay-at-home mom in Wyoming and do the exact same thing on a Raspberry Pi. That's what we built here.